Uh, okay, can you hear me? Well, thanks, Horst. I uh, appreciate that introduction, and uh, thanks to the, the local organizing committee, and Giuseppe and Alois. Um, Vienna, one of my favorite cities, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, as Horst mentioned in that kind introduction, uh, I've worked on many different systems, but I'd say the overriding sort of arc of my research interests has never strayed too far away from experimental methods. So, you know, with the keynote's address, it's not unreasonable to be somewhat uh, historical and give a broad overview. And um, that's what I'm going to do today. So, um, resilience in experimental oscillators. And, you know, I say, which we all know, no researcher is an island, so I have many graduate students and colleagues, and some of them you might recognize. In fact, on the left, I think that's the one person who's in the audience now. Richard, where are you? Over here is one of my more recent colleagues. But some of you might know Michael Thompson and Earl Dahl and Ray Plout, who have a long history in, in this area. OK, so experimental nonlinear dynamics. You know, you know most, a, a lot of the work that we do is dominated by steady state behavior. But uh, what I'm going to talk today uh, about is transient behavior and what happens to states, whether they're equilibrium states or steady state oscillations, when they're perturbed. And, you know, the basis of classic stability theory is the behavior under small perturbations. I'm going to extend that to large perturbations because I really want to investigate basins of attraction and those systems that exhibit coexisting behavior. Uh, so mechanical experiments is the kind of device. Um, this is just to uh, set the scene. So resilience, that's, that's a word I like because it means a little bit more than stability, more than local stability. And these two pictures I just found quite recently. The one on the left, is there a laser pointer? Uh, the one on the left is immediately after a, a hurricane in Texas, Galveston, Texas. And uh, this house withstood it completely. <laughs> And it was the only house on this whole beach. So that's what I would call a resilient state. Okay? It's an equilibrium state. It's just something sitting there. The, there are lots of examples, especially in the western part of the US, where there are rocks that are balanced. And what's interesting about that is that a geologist will look at that and say, OK, given this uh, geographic condition, um, this area could not have been subject to an earthquake above a certain magnitude, otherwise that wouldn't be standing. So it actually kind of contains some historical um, footprints, if you like, and it's, it's quasi-resilient. So clearly, under small perturbations, that is stable. But it doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize under large perturbations, that is not likely to be stable. OK, so this is the outline of my uh, talk. Small perturbations, then large perturbations, which you know, clearly is more interesting, but I will start with small perturbations. I'm going to look at four distinct systems, not in equal detail. Two are smooth, two are non-smooth, because you know, that's clearly a subset of interest in our community, non-smooth dynamical systems. Uh, two are single degree of freedom, and of course the beauty of a single degree of freedom that's system that's forced is this phase space is three-dimensional. You take a point carry section, everything is nicely in the plane. So there's some uh, unambiguous um, sort of pictorial descriptions we can make. Uh, a buckle beam with effectively an infinite number of degrees of freedom and um, a flutter in airfoil has a few degrees of freedom. So that's, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so real basic. <laughs> I'm not sure how many thought they would see a spring mass damper diagram in this conference, but of course in textbooks this is standard. So here's our linear oscillator with light damping. And what I'm going to do is just decrement the stiffness as a function of time. So I call this an evolving system. Uh, but um, if we just numerically simulate that, say, and perturb the system, what you notice is these perturbations take longer to decay. And that's because the stiffness is getting less, right, basically. And the way this is scaled is that this stiffness drops to zero when t equals 500, and then the system just drops off. OK, we like to recast these things in state variable format from which we can directly take out the eigenvalues. And 
If we do that for this particular system and put things in terms of the trace and determinant of the eigenvalues, this is what happens. So this is the root locus, and everyone I think is familiar with this. These are the eigenvalues as a function of trace and determinant, which depend on stiffness and damping. And we're in the stable region, the quadrant here. So we start here, decrease the stiffness, just like this. And we come along here, the system goes critically damped and then almost immediately goes unstable. Right? Standard stuff. You can track the eigenvalues in terms of their real part and imaginary and so on. And then we can incorporate that into a nonlinear context. And here, I've just put this in the form of a, a supercritical pitchfork bifurcation, and the same applies. And of course, and we can linearize and oscillations decay. So in this case, there is a choice beyond the critical point. So a small perturbation would just lead to the locally available equilibrium. A large perturbation could go somewhere else. Right? Coexist in equilibria is what we're interested in here, initially. OK, so let's do um, make some, uh, show some experimental results. And these are just demonstrations. So this was done recently in my lab. Uh, and this is a strip. I can find my mouse. There it is. So this is just a loop, and I was taking some data with this. And you notice it's got coexisting equilibria. This is buckled sort of downwards, and dependent on the perturbation, you can make it pop up. So there are these two coexisting. Nothing else changes. It's just perturbing from one to the other. And this is actually a time series. And you can think of these bars as my finger, where I'm tapping it. So, you, so here there are two coexisting equilibria. And you can see they've got different local free decay characteristics, but it's quite easy to perturb from one to the other. So it's just for demonstration purposes. And then if you make the loop a little bit longer, it collapses. So one of the two equilibrium configurations is collapsed. OK, so I'm not going to show any data, although I do have measured data from this. This is just as an example. Two other examples to kind of set the scene. And this one, again, is very recent. This is what I call a pinball. So what we have here is a, um, a solenoid trigger. This is one of my graduate students. If we perturb this equilibrium by a small amount, nothing much happens, right? Just stable equilibrium. A little bit further, it now comes into contact with this impact, and there's a solenoid trigger triggered by this laser that causes this to be punched. Now, I call this a pinball machine, because you may remember in the olden days, a pinball machine was you'd pull back a plunger and it'd fire off a, a ball bearing and, and get kicked away. Uh, the other example to generate some uh, <coughs> ideas here is this is just a thin arch pushed on, and then you can change the equilibrium configuration by perturbing the system, in this case with uh, one of my students' fingers. And you can change the direction. And this is a plunger that's pushing on here with a load cell, and you'll see that it pops. So that's a snap event. And one of my other interests is buckling, elastic stability. So that's all very well, coexisting equilibria. Right? The system can be here or here. It's bistable, basically. But what's more interesting, and certainly in this conference, what we're more interested in in general, is uh, forced, harmonically forced systems. So now we have a three-dimensional phase space for a single degree of freedom. But we can do the same trick. This is a game we can decrement the stiffness. And not only do we get instability, of course, there's a little bit of overshoot because this system isn't quite in steady state. Uh, we also get resonance. And resonance occurs, of course, when there's this relationship between the force and frequency and the natural frequency. Uh, we can take a point carry section and uh, one of the nice things about this audience is I don't have to explain what a point carry section is, right? <laughs> this is a, a figure from my advisor's book. 
Um, and with a linear oscillator, of course, we do have access to an exact analytic solution, which is a luxury we almost never have, of course, but in this case we do. So we can convert using a point carry section from a 3D flow to a 2D map. We can actually explicitly write down what the eigenvalues are. And you know, this is well described in these textbooks. And do the same thing. We can look at a ro root locus. Now, this time it's a map. But still, we can couch things in terms of the trace and the determinant of the underlying map. These are different examples of where the eigenvalues might be. And this ev evolving system that I just showed you starts here, goes down here, goes back up here, goes unstable here. So rather than the lower quadrant as the region of inst uh, stability, this triangle is the region of stability for the map. And then you can also put in terms of a root locus, and this goes unstable when a characteristic multiplier exits the unit circulars. We're all familiar with that standard stuff. OK, so, so much for the introduction, really. What we're really interested in, of course, is forced nonlinear oscillation, oscillations, where we may have coexisting periodic attractors, perhaps chaotic attractors. And again, all, all, most of what I'm going to talk about is experimental. So this is the first uh, system. This is from quite a few years ago, but you'll all recognize this hardening spring oscillator. And this is just consistent of a mass with two springs, and the motion is in this direction. So this is a uh, photo of the experiment. So these springs give a geometrically nonlinear restoring force. And you can write the equation of motion like this. So it's not too bad. You can expand that as a, a series, say, and come up with an analytic solution, or you solve this numerically. These black points are experimental data. So what I'm showing here are two time series, one from down here and one from up here. So this is, of course, the resonant jump, right? one of the most standard features in nonlinear dynamics. And what I'm going to do is look at perturbations as we come along here and see what's changing prior to the jump and do that experimentally. So this is a summary of the results. So now we're down here with a certain force and frequency. We get to this point, and we have a response like this. So it's a steady state. This is the amplitude of the steady state. We perturb the system, and I'll talk about how I perturb later. And there's some transient oscillations, and it decays back. It's stable. There's an eigenvalue, a pair of eigenvalues associated with this. Now, as we decrease the force and frequency, we get to this point, say, where this happens. So this is the transient behavior. And you can see that the frequency has slowed down. And then we're getting this sluggish pre-instability behavior that we're familiar with. So you do that for all these, repeatedly perturb the system. And then you can extract the eigenvalues. And I'll show you how we do that in the next slide. And you see the eigenvalues perform a root locus and shortly after these red points, they coalesce, and one pops out the unit circle, and we get a saddle node bifurcation. Right? And these are the transients. This is all experimental. So these are the transients. So that's a long-lived oscillation, this one. This is a period five, basically, five point carry points per oscillation. And that works well. Uh, one danger is, though, of course, when you're here, if you perturb too big, if your perturbation is not small, you can perturb right onto this other attractor. And this, that's an experimental example of, of that. So as you come along towards the subtle node, the basin of attraction is shrinking. So the perturbations you can get away with are, are rather limited. OK, so how do we perturb a system? Well, here's an example. So what, what I'm going to do is take a lot of data after perturbations and put them in these two matrices, and then we can just simply solve this in a least squares sense. Right? So from that, you can extract the eigenvalues fairly easily. So here's an example of a perturbation. This is just a pendulum, and we have a break. So it's like a disk break. So we have some oscillation, steady state, and we just tap the break. 
And what that break does, is shown in this next video, where, there, there was the perturbation. And you see it almost went still and then generated a transient, and now it's back in its steady state. I, I don't think there was volume on that, was there? there? There should be a, you can hear the click when I apply the brake. Let's play it again. No. Uh, okay. Anyway, this brake is applied for a brief period. It kicks the system out of its steady state and then we um, extract eigenvalues experimentally. But that's for small perturbations. I mean, what's most interesting to me is large perturbations. And before I get into my specific examples, let me give you this very, very familiar example. So here's a softening spring, the good old pendulum, regular pendulum. And we have this hysteresis region, small amplitude, large amplitude. And these are basins of attraction. And this is just illustrative. I haven't really properly labeled these. But this is experimental. This is experimental. So we have two coexisting attractors, large amplitude, small amplitude. This is a numerical simulation, which you'll be somewhat familiar with. And we can use time delay coordinates or position velocity. Because velocity is tough to get experimentally, because when you differentiate, it encourages noise. So we typically use time lag embedding. And time lag embedding is another issue that I don't need to describe to this audience, because it's a very familiar concept. All right, so I'm going to look at those four examples now. Uh, this first one is a link model, very similar to what um, was described in the lecture yesterday about Hans Troger and what interested him, these discrete link models. You can really learn a lot from them. So this is a, a single degree of freedom link model. This angle describes the state of this system at any instant of time. And there's an arrangement of springs and so on. You can change equilibrium and damping. And, but basically, it's a single degree of freedom forced oscillator. And you'll see in the videos that I'm going to show next how this works. So what is interesting from a theoretical point or practical point of view is snap through. So clearly, you can imagine an oscillation here. There's another equilibrium configuration here with small oscillations. Then there's the possibility of these large amplitude snap through oscillations, which are worrying, worrisome. All right, so here's some videos. So the first one I'm going to show is this one. This is just uh, basically linear, uh, small amplitude oscillations. So this is what we call our Scotch yoke that gives a harmonic excitation, transmissibility, but still harmonic, through here. And there are small amplitude oscillations, and they can be about the other side. Change the forcing parameters slightly, maybe. And you can get something like this. That's still periodic, but it's not simple harmonic. It's, it's more complicated than that. Uh, snap through. So if you, I mentioned the potential energy well, but you, you, you can figure what the potential energy well looks like. It's a double well. Uh, and then, for other combinations, you can get chaos, where there's this random-like, non-repeating behavior. Sometimes there's intermittent snap-through. And you can do all the metrics, you know, Lyapunov exponents and broadband power spectrum and so on. And what I'm saying with this is some of these coexist for the same forcing parameters. And as an engineer, we don't much like this behavior. We prefer this behavior. Less stress, less uh, problems. Um, doesn't always want to move on. OK. And, and you know, we, we do build numerical models. And I'm not going to dwell on numerical models at all in this talk. But this is a plain old comparison between theory and experiment. Point carry section, reconstructed phase trajectories, power spectra, time series. So we do have very good numeric. Oh, I mean, it's a single degree of freedom system. It's not that hard. It's not all that different from Duffin's equation, in fact. OK, so a bifurcation diagram is really what we want to get at. So this takes some explaining. 
Our control parameter is the force in frequency. The thing we're plotting is the point carry displacement. So this is a snapshot, an instantaneous snapshot at a given force in phase. Uh, and so these two, well, there's three, but these two outer horizontal dashed orange lines are the equilibrium configurations, the underlying, stable, static equilibrium configurations. So this top one is uh, numerical. So you start integrating the system slowly, and you follow this green line. And then it does this wild snap-through behavior, and then it settles down onto this red line. So clearly, there's a sort of resonant effect. The natural frequency is 1.36. I haven't normalized this. So resonance is right in here. This is experimental. So you, the correlation is really very good. There's a slight shift in where the chaos and cross-world behavior occurs, but that's just modeling. And here's another comparison between numerical and experimental, and this happens to be a period six, I think. You see buried within this chaotic region, we have periodic windows. This is experimental. And so you do get this, it's very finely controlled. This is a period eight, seven, and so on. So the excitation is this. So these are our real control parameters. We tend to fix this and vary this. So that's what you would do. You'd sweep from one low frequency regime to a higher. And this is numerical still. In terms of the force in parameters, this is a summary. Some of you may have seen pictures like this. There's various fractal behavior. But the results I showed here from the previous slide is the bifurcation diagram when you traverse through here. So this white area is non-snap through. The black area is snap through. So the green is the small amplitude motion. Hits this point, system starts snapping through, and then you exit this region here. Important thing though, this doesn't tell the complete story because the initial conditions are basically the rest state. And you've got to realize with the parameter space, for every point on this parameter space, we should really investigate all the initial conditions. It's a daunting prospect. But numerically, not so tough. And this is the result. So this is the black is the same as before. The gray is where you get snap through for any initial conditions. You just vary the initial conditions and see if you get snap through. So there's something interesting going on. This is what I call the complete bifurcation diagram. So what we had before, do you remember, was the green, blue, red. Of course, if you start off in the other potential energy well, you get red, and this you can get in the other original potential energy well here. But look at all this. This is steady state behavior for other initial conditions. So sweeping, where you graduate, like continuation, numerical continuation is risky because you're always following the solution in the vicinity of where you are. I mean, that's what makes it work. But there's this other stuff going on remotely that you uh, can find, if you're lucky, um, experimentally as well. And this is what I'm going to talk about next. So these are the basic four types of behavior. Small amplitude behavior about the left hand well, this is an energy about this. Small amplitude behavior about the other minimum. And then periodic snap through or chaotic snap through. I'm going to label those both as blue. I'm not going to distinguish between them. They're both bad large amplitude snap through behavior. So this is the way to do it experimentally. The red points are point carry points. So the system is oscillating, small amplitude. These gray bars are where we perturb the system. Okay, that generates transients. And then we go back to the original forcing, and it results, in this case, in snap-through behavior. All these point carry points are labeled blue. Then we perturb again, generate some transients, go back to the baseline forcing. This one settles down into a small amplitude motion about the positive theta equilibrium. Label that red. Perturb. So you just keep doing this indefinitely. So all these red points then have a label, a color label attached to them according to where they end up. 
So this is different from numerical simulation where you can systematically vary the initial conditions, although I do do that experiment, uh, numerically. All right, so this is numerical then. So this is that bifurcation diagram where all the initial conditions, we hope, are investigated as a function of the control parameter. And this is an animation. Uh, position, velocity, so these are initial conditions, and I'm going to sweep through F, actually from zero, from off this chart, all the way up to two. And um, I hope this works. So here's the label. When it gets to about four, that's here, you can see the blue, green, red are all mixed together, and blue gets bigger and bigger. And it gets to this point, blue takes over completely, all snap through, and then you get these colors, and you end up with just red uh, and green at this end. All right? So all this blue stuff is missed if you just sweep through, if you do a conventional bifurcation diagram. But if you investigate all the initial conditions, this stuff is there, it's, it's real. That's numerical. Here's just one example. So if you start with an initial condition somewhere in this blue, you can end up with a periodic oscillation. It's not symmetric, but it's snapping through. So it's this angle we're plotting. So it does a tap, a double tap here, and that's the time series. Because it's snapping through, we label that blue. It's the initial condition wherever it started from was in the blue. But the point is, if I change the initial conditions, I can also go into the green or red, which is the small amplitude solution. <coughs> but that's all very well for numerical data. It's experimental data that really uh, is most interesting. All right, so we do the same thing experimentally. This is experimental data, and what we're having here is a small amplitude oscillation we perturb, it stays there. Perturb again, large amplitude mode, and so on. So we can label all these points according to where they end up. And these perturbations are random by changing the force in suddenly for a short period of time. That's also random. I hope this works. This is a bit tricky, this video. These two should be linked. They should start at the same time. Not yet. Yeah, the resolution isn't very good, but this is the angle. And now we perturb the foot. See, it stopped. It actually literally stopped. And it starts up. That generates some transients, but it's still small amplitude. And then at this point, see it speed up? And now it's, it's traversed the basin boundary into this snap through behavior. And then we perturb the force in again and it stays in this, I mean, there's transient behavior, clearly, but it goes into this steady state snap through, perturb again, and you just keep doing this, you know, hours. And for each uh, perturbation, it generates maybe 20 initial conditions. I say initial conditions because every time they go through the Poincaré section, it's the same um, state, if you like. And then here, so this is still large amplitude, and then it perturbs here, sped up actually, generated a transient, and now it's settled down into that small. So according to the color coding, I think this is red, this is blue, red, blue, and sometimes you can perturb it, of course, so that it does small amplitude about the other side, which is green. Okay, so you just keep doing that. And this is a typical result. So these are basins of attraction for experiments in uh, experiments and simulation in a case where there are three coexisting attractors. The blue is the large amplitude snap through, the green and red are small amplitude, effectively linear oscillations about equilibrium. And then these, these dots are the steady state periodic attractors. Another example. This is just where there's small amplitude this way, small amplitude that way, but no snap through, no blue. 
So summarising all that is quite challenging. But if we go back to our bifurcation diagram, here are four snapshots at four frequencies, these vertical lines. This first one is with a frequency, uh, this is dimensional, 0.5 hertz, which is this one. You can see there's blue, green, and red, sort of pretty much equally. And this, uh, these are the experimental results. So you have to use kind of your imagination, but you can see that the colors correspond. Uh, I can talk later about why these are an odd shape. You, experimentally, you can't just come up with a grid of initial conditions. You just perturb the system. And when you perturb a system, it knows what the global dynamics wants to do. So there are manifolds and all sorts of subtleties. These are other results where we're now coming out of the resonant period, the resonant regime. All blue, <laughs> all blue. So there are some interesting transient behavior, but they tend to settle down to snap through. And then these two are where you just get uh, small amplitude oscillations and no snap through. And to summarize that, you can uh, draw a bar chart. So this again is a bifurcation diagram, but this tells you how many of the initial conditions go to red, how many to green. So what's most fascinating is where you get three colors, blue, red, and green for the same frequency. Because if you sweep up and sweep down, you've only got two. But this shows that there are other things possible as well. And this is experimental, which, you know, I'd say that the correlation is quite good. Okay, this is just another brief example of um, uh, a system I've worked on. This is a, if you like, a 2D Duffin oscillator, chaos. The blue and red have started from the same initial conditions. And, you know, I'm not really talking about chaos here, but in terms of initial position, you can think of this is numerical, this is experimental. So if you start the ball rolling near the bottom of one of the wells, obviously it will stay there. This is for the autonomous system. If you start close to the edge, the ball has enough energy to maybe meander and roll out. It could even roll all the way back again. And then you can color code according to that. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go through these last examples really quickly. So this is a continuous analog of Duffin's equation. And this is actually Richard's foot. Do you recognize your shoes? <laughs> so this is where we have a buckled beam clamped, clamped, subject to inertial forcing. This is an instrumented impact hammer, and you can perturb between behaviors. It's not so easy to see. You, you can see that. So this one but it has equilibrium there and equilibrium here, and then this is vibrating about those equilibria. Now, there, there's a lot to do here. There's, this speckled pattern is, is so we can use DIC to measure the response of the system. Anyway, what's most interesting then is, is really this. So there's a buckled out, buckled in. And if you do a sweep and measure the response in some way, if you sweep up, you get this red data. Yeah, it goes chaos and chaotic and so on, and back down again. If you then sweep the other way, you get the blue. So you get this nice hysteresis, right? Different paths according to the direction of sweep. About the buckle down configuration, you get this and this. So again, there's some hysteresis here. So what I'm gonna do is just choose one frequency, 118 hertz. If you believe this picture, there's one steady state oscillation, two, Three. Then it's not symmetric. You know, you, it, experimentally, it's almost impossible to get a symmetric system. But if you believe this picture, it says that there are, you're in the resonant hysteresis region for this, and there's an isolated attractor here. So there are three periodic attractors that you might expect there. But to use this stochastic uh, interrogation technique and jumble in the initial conditions, and this is what you get. So this is that impact hammer, and these are the transients that are being generated. If you look carefully, can you see there's a small amplitude oscillation? There's a medium oscillation about the out 
configuration. The in configuration, there's a small amplitude, there's a medium amplitude, and there's a large amplitude. So there are actually five coexistent attractors. Five coexistent, and this is, an ex this is all experimental data. So these are those five attractors superimposed. This is the time series, this is the phase projection. Two attractors here, three attractors here. Well, the bifurcation diagram suggested there were three, right? At that one frequency. But now we've discovered five. And this are just typical initial conditions that end up at different attractors, right? So small, medium, large, small, large, or medium. And these are all those initial conditions. This is done thousands and thousands of times. And these are the results superimposed. So these are the five attractors. Now what you notice, they are falling on top of each other, aren't they? Well, this is a continuous system. It's not a single degree of freedom system. So in the point carry section, the phase space is not 2D, it's something higher. And this is simply a projection uh, okay, very briefly then, this is another system that I've looked at, and what you have here is a, a perturbation from one attractor to another. Yeah. Okay, so that motion is non impacting, this is non smooth. It's this behavior. And then my student comes along and perturbs it, just taps it. So there's coexisting, small amp, this is a bifurcation diagram, angle. This is max min, so this was that small amplitude oscillation, non-impacting, that coexists with this big amplitude, and then he stops it again. So at this particular frequency, whatever it is, there's a small amplitude, non-impacting, large amplitude impacting, and those are the, bound, the initial conditions that lead. The blue leads to this, the red leads to this. By stability with domains of attraction. And then the last thing I'm gonna do, just a few slides, is um, see if this works for an Air Force system. Uh, I know there probably aren't many aeroelastic people in the audience, but really this is a, a three degree of freedom, three mechanical degrees of freedom. Plunge, uh, uh, which is sometimes called heave. This is a flap motion and then a pitch in motion. So it's all linear other than a loose flap. Where there's the loose flap, we have free play. So it's a non-smooth characteristic. See, so this jiggles. And this is actually a practical problem in many aircraft. The flaps wear loose, so they have to be tightened up every so often. So this is an experimental study. And the question is, if there's coexistent behavior, how can you show that? Now, this is our wind tunnel, and here's the airfoil, that airfoil mounted vertically. And these are two slotted cylinders that rotate. That rotation causes a disruption of the flow and we can switch those on and off and perturb this system, just like the brake mechanism, but this is where the flow gets disturbed. And so this is actually an experimental trace of one of the variables measuring this motion. And you can see when these slotted cylinders, these slotted cylinders get switched on here, it causes this perturbation. And then from that perturbation and transient, you can extract eigenvalues and perhaps basins of attraction if the perturbation is big enough. And of course it is. So here's a bifurcation diagram, experimental, where the control parameter is now flow speed, not force in frequency. This is the flow in the wind tunnel. And then we're just measuring the response. And so it starts to flutter at a critical wind speed. This is limit cycle oscillations. And then it jumps down to another type of oscillation. If you slow down the speed, it comes along here, jumps up. So again, we get hysteresis. And I'm going to call one of these tap, one of these buzz. You'll see in the video what, they, what they're like. This tap motion is like this, not very symmetric, somewhat chaotic, actually. This is a point carry section. It's a high order system, right? Three degrees of freedom. 
plus three velocities, so it's quite high order. But this buzz oscillation is very periodic, very steady. So those are our two coexisting solutions. Okay, so you do the stochastic interrogation, and it doesn't show up all that clearly, but those two alternative oscillations generate these initial conditions. And again, this is a projection, so that's why they overlap. So we have green and yellow, and these are the two steady state oscillations. And you can see by this point, the yellow is taken over completely. We're down here. If I did this up here, it would be all green. What's most interesting is where you get this green and yellow, because that's in the hysteresis region, where you're continually jogging the system between the two attractors. And my final thing is actually a video to show that. And um, so this is the wind tunnel. And yeah, these are the slotted cylinders. The flow is from right to left. So we have some steady state oscillation. You can barely see it. Then we switch on these. That causes a disruption in the flow. That causes a transient motion. From that transient motion, you can extract eigenvalues. And if the disruption is big enough, it can actually snap from one oscillation to another. This video, can you actually, that's my shadow. Can you see that in the glass? And my graduate student is hiding behind the scenes. So this is oscillating in flow. And, and try and remember that. Here's me. A signal to my student. He puts his hand over and he taps this. And that's the coexisting solution. So he's perturbed from one steady state flutter to another steady state flutter. Uh, and you can just keep doing this thousands of times. And that's how those colored pictures were generated. OK, so just a couple of notes before the conclusions then. Um, I haven't talked about the fact that, yeah, the, the color plots show basins of attraction. But each point, you can also label how long it takes to get to a steady state. So there's that whole other duration direction that I haven't talked about, and there's a lot of useful information there. Uh, it's fairly clear that unstable orbits and manifolds organize the phase space on a global level, and I haven't really talked much about that. Uh, it's, this is especially interesting when you have chaotic transients, because those basins of attraction morph with time. They're not invariant, they're not set. And of course, it's possible to show certain fractal properties depending on the parameters, but you know, noise in, experiment, um, in experimental studies tends to be a problem with fractals because the geometric description is so subtle. All right, so uh, conclusions. I started with small perturbations. We can get everything we need to know, really. And, and it's not restricted to the order of the system. It's all linear algebra, and we're all familiar with that. But it works just fine with experiments. Perturbations are much more interesting. And this is a quote that I've used before. This is my PhD advisor, actually. And it's somewhat obvious, right? But it's still important to emphasize. You know, and we like to do these sweeps of parameters and bifurcation diagrams, but we can miss a lot of uh, other things by looking at different starting conditions. So resilience, to sum up, is really the word I'm giving for local and global stability. And uh, as I say, sweeping doesn't tell the whole story. You can miss. There are certain hidden solutions that you need to interrogate the initial condition space. And that's, um, that's completes my presentation. Thank you, Professor Virgin, for this excellent presentation with a lot of colorful slides. And uh, those of you who are working in the experimental nonlinear dynamics, they know and value the great results we have seen in this presentation. We have got a few minutes for a discussion or for questions, so please raise your hand and... This one. as to 
as to, I don't think I need it, but do you have any indication as to sort of the underlying dynamics behind those five? Is it a single mode with sort of, well, do the dynamics involve a single mode or multiple modes? And how do you determine that experimentally? <laughs> Well, that's, that is a, that's the crux of the problem. It's, um, we, we think a handful of modes are involved, more than just one, though. Uh, but we use this DIC uh, technique to take data. So we do have the full field. Uh, it's an awful lot of data that gets generated. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, that's the $64,000 question. How, how many modes are really participating or active in that? Um, and that's, in fact, Richard is following up on that very question, but yeah, a few, a few modes. Yeah. Well, uh, I found very interesting your talk. Uh, did you investigate also the problem of stability for positive systems? Positive means for any non-negative initial conditions and for all not negative inputs the state variable and output of the system is not negative. Did you investigate this type of system? Um, I'm not entirely sure what you, you mean. Uh, yeah, but perhaps I will explain you later, later okay. okay? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting lecture. I have a question about how you determine your initial conditions, because you say you, you switch on, let's say, the cylinder in the floor, or you tap the system. It's, the question is, OK, from this, how do you take your displacement velocity, whatever you need to put in your yeah. plot? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, good question. So what happens is um, you might switch the force in at a certain time. You, the first time the trajectory penetrates the point carry section is, is the important data. And the point carry section that we typically use is a force in phase. So that's triggered by the Scotch yoke forcing mechanism. So when the arm goes through a certain angle, at that instant, that's where we take the data. Okay? So, and then the next time, so it's, yeah, it's an external point carry section trigger. So even though, and that can be a problem because you can perturb and it can be almost a complete cycle before you hit that. And of course the phase space is capable of distorting quite a bit in that first cycle. So that's basically why we get these kind of bald patches because it's number one, it's difficult to generate initial conditions in a mechanical system any which way. Right, you can't instantaneously change the velocity from here to here because we have inertia and so on. But also we have this additional problem of, of it can take a, almost a complete cycle before it first penetrates the point carry section and during that time things have somewhat contracted. Right? D dissipative global dynamics. Just a quick, uh, quick comment. It was a really beautiful and precise experiment. Uh, when you try to select that to which attractor it will settle, then sometimes you had this uh, chaotic like transients. Have you ever tried to check the lengths or to make mm -hmm. a statistics about this chaotic transients? Uh, absolutely. In fact, we're just preparing a manuscript now. And I would, uh, well, in North Carolina, I think it's four o'clock in the morning now. But I'm hoping one of my graduate students is doing exactly that these days. Um, so, yeah. So what happens is, um, with a certain, for example, a crisis bifurcation, it's well known that chaotic transients can last for arbitrary lengths. So yeah, we would produce snapshots of the basins of attraction as a function of time. And there are cases where the chaos disappears completely, if you wait long enough. So for short time horizons, you have nice basins of attraction with chaos and periodicity. If you wait, and you're in a chaotic transient regime, the chaotic basin shrinks and disappears. So yeah, it was definitely interesting.
Yeah, yeah, there's definitely scale in, in involved. Sure. Uh, dear Professor Lawrence, uh, I would be uh, very happy to see your uh, presentation. It's a very nice uh, model, very nice pictures and also the development. I would like to see you uh, very interesting dynamics, especially the experimental result. It's exactly the numerical uh, result. I think we have done something about the also later you have uh, original uh, pre presented uh, you know, experimentally. Uh, the one of the interesting uh, phenomena is uh, buckling. It's, uh, you know, the spring uh, mass system, there is a buckling behavior. Uh, there is also, I saw your presentation, there is a uh, mass on the plate, there is some uh, uh, beams uh, behind it, the vibration like this. Do you think this system have a multiple buckling behavior? Do, do I think it's... Uh, the, the, the experiment like this, I think this would be the buckling, uh, the multiple buckling behavior will be uh, happened in this system, I think. Yeah, I mean, there are all sorts of uh, instabilities in our system, and, and the equation of mo motion captures everything. It includes all the inertias and springs and yeah, I was just focusing on one particular phenomenon. But yeah, there are other instability phenomena. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Harry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I had a question about your pendulum, your first pendulum. Uh, you showed that there were two steady state uh, regime solutions, one with a small amplitude and one with a big amplitude which was not symmetric. And uh, my question was about the, the large one. Is it an isolated steady state solution in, in the phase plane or uh, can, can you have it by a continuation? The regular pendulum? Yeah, the regular pendulum, forced pendulum. There was a, uh, a small amplitude yeah, oscillation yeah. and uh, you take the pendulum yeah. and you showed a large amplitude oscillation, which was a steady state, I think. Yes, yes. And is it isolated in, in the phase plane or is it a continuation of a... Well, it, yeah, I mean, so, right, the parameters, the, the control parameter I use is the force in frequency, but there's a fixed force in amplitude as well. So, yeah, you can change that force and amplitude and, and get different phenomena, but um, so, so the way that result works is you just increase the force and frequency, you follow the small branch, it snaps up and down, and then as you decrease the force and frequency, it follows the upper branch and then that drops down. It, it is so, a classical duffing... Uh... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, okay. Yeah, that, that was, was just, it, okay. Yeah, it was just introductory, that particular example. Any more questions? Okay. <laughs> Let's work on this side. <laughs> yeah, I thought I just want to make it fair. All the questions are from this side. Thank you very much, Professor Lawrence, for this very interesting presentation. So I thought, I mean, the coexistence of those five solutions, as I was thinking, maybe super harmonic coexisting with, you know, it's hardening behavior, you have two stable solutions coexisting with primary, but these are typically at very low damping. And I was, you know, my question was the role of damping. Were you suffering from the fact that maybe damping is high and you had to do something so that these coexistence of solutions would appear? So my question is, what's the role of damping in your results? Well, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, damping you know, from my perspective, dampen is just one of those things you live with. You can't control it, necessarily. Um, I'd say in a linear um, damping ratio, in fact, Richard, he's chatting. Richard, what was the, what was the damping coefficient in the beam, roughly? 
one or two percent. It's a very small damping. And uh, yeah, we just didn't investigate the role of damping, but um, sure, if you change the damping, then the modal activity changes. Uh, yeah, but it is what it is. Yeah, yeah if you add damping, it makes the interest in less behave less interesting. Well, I guess we can close this keynote lecture session and thank Laurie Virgin once more again for this wonderful presentation. <laughs>